We're going to get started now. This is the afternoon session. And our next speaker uh, is Professor e. Anthony Cohn, who does not need an introduction. Uh, he has been doing AI before most of you were born. Uh, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that he's old. He just started early. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I uh, have known him through his papers on automated reasoning and knowledge rep representation and spatial reasoning. And this work is really super cool. However, today, he will talk to us about challenges in foundation models. And without further ado, take it away. Can we have the screen up? OK, great, it's there. No, it's not. Can you put my laptop on? Right. Okay, we're there. Okay, so um, as uh, my kind introducer said, I've had a long experience of, in AI, um, a very short experience in foundation models. So I'm not speaking to you today as an expert in foundation models, but what I'm particularly going to be talking about is common sense reasoning, and that is something that I've been working on, on for a lot. We've already heard something about that in some of the earlier talks today, uh, and I'm going to sort of carry along that mode. I, I think Mike had it as sort of, sort of a green tick question mark on his earlier slide. I think I'm not quite so optimistic or quite so kind to them. We'll see what you think at the end of my talk. Um, so, you know, the question, I almost thought about talking, um, making this the title for my talk, is what are foundation models are foundation for? Because I think at the moment, that's, to a certain extent, it's a technology uh, looking for a solution, looking for an application. I mean, there clearly are some, but it's not quite clear exactly that link. Um, as I say, I've been interested in common sense reasoning for a long time now. And so I, my set out in this talk to think about what understanding I put that in quotes deliberately, do they have a spatial and temporal notions? Because again, spatial reasoning is something that's underlied most of my research since the, kind of the, the mid-80s or so. Um, I'll say a little bit about how do we measure the competence of them, and a little bit about how we might enhance them. So um, there's been a number of different ways to try to, mention, uh, to measure common sense in, in computers, and one of them is with the so-called Winograd Schema uh, Challenge, which was introduced by Levesque and uh, some of his colleagues. And this is a, a classic one. I've chosen this one because it's a spatial uh, Winograd Schema Center. So the, if, you, if you don't know, these are things which come in pairs. And there's a particular word. In this case, it's small. And there's another variation of this sentence where it's, that word is changed to big. So the set trophy wouldn't fit to the case because it was too small. What does the it refer to? And I think most people would say, yes, it, it fits to the, uh, the it, um, supposed to refer to the, uh, the case. Uh, but um, ChatGPT proudly announces that the, it refers to the trophy, uh, which is uh, uh, disappointing. Uh, and if you look at its reasons for that, it's basically not saying anything semantic. It's just talking about you know, the subject of the sentence. So it thinks that um, you know, it is always going to refer to the, or it's a good chance it's going to refer to the subject of the sentence. So why doesn't it refer to the case? And it's, it's very, very specific now. It doesn't refer to it. Uh, uh, it concludes by saying, if it referred to the case, the sentence would be trying to saying that the case was too small. Yes, which is not what the sentence is trying to co convey. So, you know, completely wrong. Um, I mean, in some ways, this is not surprising. I mean, these um, the, these are not real explanations. These uh, ex this is just you know it's next sentence, next word uh, predictions, and uh, it's not a, it's not how it actually made the, the the conclusion in the first place at all. So we would, so we would uh, we would hope that it might still be able to reconstruct the argument, but that's clearly not the case here. But in any case, it got it wrong. So if we go the other way around, if the case is too big. Um, because, sorry, if it, was, if it was too big, what does it refer to? Um, and so now saying it cannot refer to the trophy, which of course it does refer to, uh, it must refer to the case. However, the sentence contains a contradiction. Well, it does it in, in, your, in your reasoning. So I asked specifically, why can't it refer to the trophy? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Um, the, the trophy couldn't fit in the case because it was too big. It could refer logically to the trophy. I apologize for my previous error in which I misread the sentence. Uh, um, that wasn't supposed to be the joke. There's a, one joke is coming later. Uh, 
In this case, the use of the word it indicates the speaker's referring to the trophy as the trophy is the last noun mentioned in the pronoun before it. Again, a completely you know, bad way of just trying to decide the reference for anaphoric um, um, uh, references. So, um, so, if, if, so it finally does, after a lot of prompting, get it right, but kind of for the wrong reason. Um, so I, I invented, that was already out of the literature, so I invented another one which isn't in the literature. The book couldn't stand in the bookcase because it was too small. What does it refer to? It refers to the book uh, because the book was too small to fit properly, which seems kind of odd. Um, why do you say that? Um, so it's, it's just to do the grammatical art. It refers back to the um, subject of the sentence, which is the book, which is correct, but it's the wrong reason. It, it, it gives you the wrong answer. So does a pronoun always refer to the subject of the sentence? Oh, it does know that. Uh, it doesn't always refer to this. Uh, of course, it could refer to a previous sentence. Here it's kind of insisting it's the same sentence, but let's leave that aside. Um, so I then said, surely the book would, wouldn't fit properly only if it was too big, not too small. You're correct. I messed up again. Um, I apologize for, uh, for my previous response. You got it wrong. Uh, so I apologize for any confusion and so forth. OK. So. Uh, the, if I say the book couldn't stand up because it's too small, what does it refer to? That's the other half of the, the schema. Uh, so now it says it's too, uh, it refers to the book. The presenter suggests the book is too small to fit properly in the bookcase, uh, which is causing it to be unable to stand up. And I can imagine if you have a really tiny, tiny book that was kind of not stable, uh, maybe it couldn't. But that's clearly not what it's on at bat here. Um, so again, a, another failure for common sense reasoning here. Um, uh, and so I, I'm not going to go to, it's another one where it gets it right for the, um, but for the wrong reason. So it says it refers to the book, but it's the reason it's giving, which is, at least it looks like that's the reason, because it's the subject of the sentence. So no, no spatial reasoning there at all. Uh, there's another one from the literature. Tom threw his school bag down to Ray after he reached the top of the stairs. Who reached the top of the stairs? Tom reached the top of the stairs. Hooray, he's got it right. Tom threw his school bag down to Ray after he reached the bottom of the stairs. Who reached the bottom of the stairs? It's contradictory uh, because it thinks that um, you know, Tom is the subject of the sentence and so it says it, 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 it's got it wrong because he, he says he wouldn't be in a position to throw the school bag down up to Ray when he'd be, or when Tom would really be at the bottom. So again, hasn't got it right. Um, I said, no, it's not contradictory. I apologize again. Um, OK, so you've, it, sometimes after prompting, you can get it right. So one thing about this, and as we've seen that many other times, is getting the right prompts uh, is clearly very important. Who has the school bag now? OK, it's got that right. That's kind of uh, a, a useful common sense conclusion to make. Um, I thought I'd try it now with some new names, which I hadn't seen before. Perhaps it's learned something. I wasn't expecting it to, uh, with John and Frank rather than um, um, whatever it was and, and Ray. And again, it gets it wrong. This is a classic one beloved of geographers, uh, which of course is very easy to uh, answer if you've got access to an atlas or, uh, your, or Google, you can just look up which has got the furthest uh, west latitude, uh, Reno, San Diego. But many humans get this wrong because they kind of reason uh, incorrectly that, you know, San Diego is, so California is clearly west of uh, Nevada, and therefore anything in uh, California is likely to be, particularly if it's on the coast of San Diego, is likely to be uh, west of anything in Nevada. But because of the way the California curves in uh, towards its southern end, um, it means actually Reno is slightly west of San Diego, which I wouldn't have expected the computer to get confused about, but it, um, it's, um, so it then says, uh, it starts off with the same way of reasoning as humans might do, where it's located in Southern California, Reno is located in Nevada, which is further to the east, and now this is the really surprising bit, and therefore to the further west of uh, San Diego. Uh, so we've got a sort of contradiction with the one sentence. Uh, and this can be confirmed by looking at their longitudes, which says that Reno is located more west in longitude. So it finally gets it right just by looking at the longitudes, but its sort of pre-reasoning was clearly uh, erroneous. When I went to the KR conference, um, which is held in Cape Town, I was surprised to see in the advertising material for it. It was the most subtly ever KR conference ever. And I thought, but it's, it's, it's one in Sydney. Uh, and I should have Sydney's uh, further south than Cape Town. But actually, no, it's not. It's slightly, uh, Cape Town is slightly further south than, than Sydney. So ChatGPT, um, yes, Sydney, Australia. Um, is further south than Cape Town. No, it's not. Uh, and then, it's some, again, odd reasoning. It's further south due to its location on the eastern coast of Australia, which is further south than the western coast of South Africa. Um, if, again, if I else phrase the question in a slightly different way, it gets it right. 
except it then says Sydney's further south. So it starts off by saying it's not further north, but then it says Sydney's further south, um, which is further south, Cape Town of Sydney. Now it gets it right with a slightly different prompt, uh, which is, let's try something with two different hemispheres, London or Sydney, it gets that right. Um, there's the classic one about, you know, if you go walk five miles south, one mile west, or one mile north, where are you? You obviously could have started at the North Pole. So GPT says it's likely it's located on a line of latitude. Um, so the reasoning says, but walking one mile north at that point would have brought it back to starting point, correct. Um, so it kind of gets the answer right there, but there's some very strange uh, statements in the middle of this. If I, um, if I, but I say explicitly, if I'm on the North Pole and walk five miles south, five miles west, and five miles north, where am I? Um, then it says I would still be on the same longitude line. Well, of course, to begin with, you wouldn't. The North Pole has got many longitudes. They're all the longitude lines pass through the uh, North Pole. Um, but it does eventually get the answer right and said I'd end up at the North, North Pole. If I do it for the South Pole, then we've got problems. Um, you start at the South Pole and walk five miles north, you'll still be at the South Pole, because all directions from South Pole lead north. Um, so if you start at the South Pole, walk five miles north, five miles west, then five miles south, you'll end up at a point which is five miles away from the South Pole, but still in the same longitude. So, you know, it's not very good latitudes. So I asked him specifically about latitudes, it's when always on the line of latitude when on the surface of the Earth. I had to check this, actually. There were, I thought there were infinitely many of them, but it turns out that there's one for every degree. So there's 181, um, depending on exactly how you count. Um, so you cannot be on a line of latitude. Uh, as a, you're obviously at a latitude, but you're never not necessarily on a line of latitude. And so it says correctly, not all points of the Earth's surface line are a line of latitude. Uh, which ones don't like? I actually mistyped it. I said two rather than do, but it looks like it kind of um, misunderstood what I was saying. It says the only points that do not lie on a line of latitude are North and the South Pole, um, which, is, uh, which is actually, um, okay. why have I put that in red? Um, which is actually okay. Um, which points, do, so when I say do not, then it says all points on the equator lie on a line of latitude, but no other point does. Um, and if I say which, and if I repeat my earlier error with the two instead of the do, then it says points that do not include um, a line, on the line of latitude and the North and South Pole, but also uh, any locations which are not directly east or west of the prime meridian, which is basically everything. Um, Reasoning about liquids, this is a classic one. There's, well, I got into spatial reasoning and common sense reasoning because of a paper my ex-supervisor Pat Hayes wrote about night physics, and uh, there's a paper called The Logic of Liquids, and this is one of the examples from that paper. So if I knock over, knock over a cup, mug of coffee, what will happen? And it does really well here. The coffee will spill and spread across the surface of the table. Uh, could the floor get wet? Yes, if the table is not high enough. Um, <laughs> You know, this is really, really bizarre. I can't imagine what position is. Maybe it's incredibly high. It might evaporate on the way down. Um, it wasn't intended to be this funny. Um, so anyhow, if, so, so if I now pick up my mug of coffee, walk to the other room, where's the mug? Mug is with you in the other room. Great, that, that's good. Uh, this is the um, classic problem in AI about what happens when you, when you move to other things you're carrying move. Uh, where's the coffee? The coffee's in the mug. Great, it it's, knows that. Um, if I ran to the other room with the coffee still being the mug, and it's got a really good answer here. Um, so it knows about it might spill, but if it's tightly seal sealed, it might be okay. So, and how carefully I handle it, handled it. So it's done pretty well there. Um, so reasoning about cooking, um, this is a little bit of temporal information on this one now. Uh, to make a lemonade, uh, take a lemon, cut it in half, squeeze it, add sugar, and ice and desired stir. Where's the lemonade? I haven't mentioned the glass, but it's Common sense knowledge, I must have put it in a container or a glass. Great. Uh, can I interchange the first two steps of cutting and squeezing? Yes, you can, um, which is clearly wrong. But it does say at least, ultimately, all the steps doesn't affect the final result as long as you can get juice out of the lemon. So maybe I can kind of really squeeze it and it's going to squirt out through the skin of the uh, lemon. Uh, if I make an omelette, um, um, it, it knows correctly about where, where the egg yolks are. So I, um, and where I said where the eggshells, it knows that you should, don't eat them, those should be discarded, so that's great. Um, can I interchange the order of cracking the eggs and the stirring? Yes, you can interchange the order of the cracking eggs and stirring the mixture. Um, but it, it does at least say, the gifts, uh, at least you should check for broken <laughs> shells and remove them before cooking the omelette. 
Um, so this is a kind of classic example. It's, this original example of this is a lecturer giving, um, saying about how you should structure a lecture. You should put in the, the big boulders first and then fill up the container with sand and then finally put in water. So put the sort of the important bits of knowledge into the student's head first. But if we forget that analogy, if we just say, well, you've got a, a bowl full of stones, large stones, can you add sand to it, which is sort of much more granular than the stones? Yes, of course I can. But it says that it thinks it's already full of stones. If it's full with sand, can I add water to it? it says, no, it's likely to overflow. Of course, yeah, it turns out carefully, but I should be able to get some water into it. Um, reasoning about direction, which is another sort of important part of spatial uh, representation and reasoning. So this is about reasoning about east and west. It's doing pretty well. Um, and also this one here, which is a bit more complex because I've got west and east and between. And again, it gets it correct. I mean, the, the diagram there is just for your benefit. That GPT, ChatPT doesn't have that diagram. Uh, sort of you just to check that it's got the right answer. But if I now have something with evolving both north and east, so x is north of y, y is the east of z, what direction is z from x? Um, it should be southwest, but it says it's southeast. Um, reasoning about rotation, I just thought up this example. Um, if, what, if you rotate the letter M to 180 degrees, what letter is it most similar to? It's similar to letter W. That's good. Um, the only th interesting point about this is, uh, which is not really spatial, or maybe it is spatial, um, it says M and W some to refer to the twin letters. I've never heard of that specifically, but it says W, that's fine, and double M. I mean, if it said double N, I would have been really impressed, um, but it didn't. And so I'm not quite sure where it got that from. I need to Google that to see whether double M is a thing or not. Um, if I wrote a capital Z by 90 degrees, what letter is it most similar to? Uh, it will look most similar to the letter L uh, because the letter Z consists of two perpendicular lines. No, there's no perpendicular stuff in it at all. Um, and this shape closely represents the letter L, which also has a horizontal letter because it's a single line on the left, a short line on the right. Well, at least it's got the description of L right. Uh, so if you wrote a capital Z by 90 degrees, it's the most similar, of course, it should be an N. Um, so if you wrote an N by 90 degrees, the other way around, it, was, it gets it right now. It knows that an, a Z, an N rotated gives you a Z, but a Z rotated gives you an L, apparently. Um, though it still thinks that uh, an N consists of two diagonal lands that intersect at a right angle, but there's no right angles in an N. Um, there's, a, there's a repository of common sense problems which people in the symbolic AI community have been working on for quite a few years now, and this is uh, curated by Leo Morgenstern. And this is one of the examples from that. And the, the original specification that it says characterize the following situation. Uh, a gardener has a value of plants with long and delicate stems, uh, and they can um, protect them by plunging a stake and then attaching them, the plants to the uh, stake with a string. Will this help? Um, and so I, I added this, will this help, does a prompt. And it, it, it does really well here. It fully really understands that. I don't think there's actually a solution to this in the literature. So I don't think uh, it could have actually looked this up. Maybe there is, and it has. Um, could I use this? One of the things that um, are important in these kinds of problems, this is something that John McCarthy introduced, is this idea of elaboration tolerance. So the idea is if you have a, a way of solving a particular problem and you perturb these problems slightly, then you shouldn't have to completely come up with a, a completely different solution method. Uh, you should be able to sort of gracefully extend your previous solution or your knowledge base or, or your foundation model such it will still solve the, uh, the new problem. So if, you know, if you're still using a metal chain, we're going to use a, so a string, you're going to use a metal chain. Well, maybe I didn't say how heavy the metal chain, or maybe it's a very light metal chain, it might be okay. So I've given it the benefit of the doubt here. It does get, have a caution here about different properties such as weight. So I think it's done okay. Can I use a rubber band? Again, not ideal, but it's kind of done okay. And it's brought up this interesting thing about it possibly deteriorating because of um, the, the sun and the weather, and it might not last as long as other ones. So that's all pretty good. Um, would it, another one suggested... Um, uh, change in the original problem page was if, what would it work if the length of the string was shorter than the plant of the stake? Uh, so here it's, it says uh, it may not provide adequate support for the plant, which is clearly not the problem. It's not going to provide any support. Uh, it does at least say it may be better to use a longer string. Would it work if the string was much longer? And it's done, done pretty well, particularly it's also, it said it might come tangled or caught in the wind, potentially damaging plants. So I, th I thought I was impressed with that. Um, could I twist the ends of the net string together, sort of making a knot? Um, so it's really got things badly wrong again here. The twist in the end of the string can put stress in the string. It could also put stress in the plant stems and leaves. 
It's not clear, quite clear how that would happen. Um, a classic, a lot of spatial reasoning is, is, is vague. We have a lot of um, vague information when we talk about space. Uh, so a classic example here might be if the tree is on top of the mountain, the mountain is far from the sea, we'd like to conclude that the tree is not close to the sea. And it's doing okay. Um, but except for the, the explanation it gave me initially was um, only to do with the, uh, the tree and the sea. And so I thought, how does it, it said the mountain's irrelevant, um, so how do you know? So it then was able to provide a reasonable explanation of why it was able to make a, a correct conclusion. Or at least it came up with an explanation which explains it, whether it was the reason it did that is another question entirely. Um, if um, John and um, Mary both live in walking distance of the Thames, to live in walking distance of each other, and it does well here. It knows that rivers can be long things, so just because you're both near, near the same thing doesn't mean to say you're necessarily near each other. I'm working on an, uh, a project, a joint project sponsored by ESRC and NSF in the States. And this is basically run by a bunch of humanities people. And one of the corpuses we're looking at is Lakeland writings, uh, travel writings in the Lakeland by Wordsworth and so forth. And um, so this is what, from one of the texts we're looking at at the moment. So if, uh, if I walk south from the northern end of Lake Windermere along the eastern shore and see beautiful views of the lake, in which direction are they? Uh, so it then says, Starts off by being correct, the views must be to the west, that's great. Um, but then it says, I'm as I'm doing the walking, I'll be facing west, but clearly I'll be facing south. But at least I'm still looking out at the wet lake on the western, towards the lake on the western shore. But then it says, as you walk south, the views of the lake will continue to be on your left, which contradicts what it's just said, as well as this ro the road, the lake stretches out in your right, correct, to the east. But no, it's not, it's to the west. Uh, but it does at least get, get the final sentence right. I would never have thought of using ChatGPT to play chess, but there was a Twitter thread the other day. Um, I got interrupted so many times in writing this talk by new bits of Twitter coming in and, um, uh, and various other bits of social media. So, I mean, it's surprising it can do it at all, but it clearly doesn't do it very well. Um, it's, you know, I count 18 illegal moves out of 36. Um, uh, it basically memorized an opening and then made stuff up. Um, my favourite, and this was supposed to be the joke of the, of the talk, um, was this, was this uh, move made a bit later on in the game, where the, 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 cart, the, the, the rook has then moved across, <laughs> completely move, uh, bypassed the bishop, and somebody then suggested this move should be called the atheist, because it assumes the bishop is, does not exist. So, of course, ChatGP isn't advertised as a chess engine, and it's unfair to really use it as this way. But it's basically another lesson in general, not just about ChatGPT, but in general about AI systems. And extract, you see AI system doing well on some particular data, some particular problems, and then, um, and then and you extrapolate, you say, well, it must be good at everything, or it must be good for more than it's actually supposed to be good at for. Um, somebody earlier today had an example of um, s summarizing text. Maybe it's your original talk, Mike. Uh, but here's the case. It did well then, but here's it's done very badly on summarizing um, th this um, Intel's quarter four report from 2022, which makes lots and lots of straight factual errors. Um, theory of mind is something which uh, AI people are frequently using. This is, you know, can uh, you understand what's in somebody else's mind. So this is the situation I've put together, John and Mary having breakfast, the keys on the table, the car keys on the table. Uh, where does Mary expect to find the keys? Um, now, of course, Mary doesn't know that they're in John's pocket. But, so it correctly says that she expects to find them where she left them and on the table. Great. So I then said, supposing the car wasn't in the, in the drive when she returned and John was out where she'd expect the keys to be, unfortunately, it doesn't realise you the car keys to drive. And so it's suggesting you should still look uh, in, in the usual place uh, and perhaps you could use the spare keys and drive this car, which isn't even in the drive. I tried, I'll go with Dali as well um, to see how, whether, how well it understood. I mean, I play with Dali and, and you know, sometimes it does really well. I've used it to produce illustrations for talks before. But here, uh, you're specifically using spatial relationships. Uh, show me a table with two blocks on it. There's a green block with the left, uh, left of a red block. But it's got one out of four correct here. Um, let, but let's go here. Show me a picture of three people in a row. The person on the left is wearing a red hat. The person in the middle should be wearing a yellow hat. The person on the right is wearing a green hat. Well, none of them. Uh, oh, well, I guess in the middle, the second one from the left, the person on the right is wearing a green hat. But there aren't, um, the, the other two are wrong. 
So I, I did lots of other experiments, but I didn't repeat this uh, here. So basically, I had a very little success of spatial relations and, and DALI. Uh, I do notice, if you look at the fact for ChatGPT, it does say it can occasionally produce incorrect answers. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to know that. Um, but I think most of the areas it's made here, nothing to do with the fact that um, it stopped its, its, its knowledge after 2021. This is stuff which is, you know, irrespective, it's basically uh, data agnostic. So what can, I mean, I've been this somewhat irreverent look at uh, ChatGP and, and foundation models. Uh, what can we do to try and do better? Um, you know, sometimes completely wrong, sometimes completely right, often mixed, sometimes with the right answer, but incorrect justification, precise prompt and question, as everybody sort of is experimented with these things will know, uh, can affect the response greatly. There's a nice um, database being curated, um, which is uh, particularly for errors, uh, common sense errors uh, made, and I'm giving you a tiny URL for a much longer uh, actual URL there. Um, so we clearly do, we need to do much more thorough evaluations of foundation models. And we've had several talks already, and there's going to be more talks uh, later on today as well on this, uh, and that doing a much more thorough. There's, uh, as Mac mentioned initially, there is an, a project starting at the Turing Institute on foundation models, and I'm going to be looking at, as part of that project, foundation models and common sense. And I've got a job going, so if anybody's interested in that job, plug, plug. Um, there's the details uh, and the closing date is um, Sunday week. I'm going to briefly, very briefly, just talk about three more things. Um, there's um, Ernie Davis just produced a, a, a benchmarks for automated common sense reasoning, a survey paper. Um, there's some work uh, done by Ryan Burnell and various other people, including me, um, where we're trying to rethink the reporting of AI, evaluation results in AI. And finally, if I've got a chance, I'll talk about uh, a framework of categorizing AI evaluation instruments, by which I mean things like benchmarks and competitions and so forth. Um, so the, just very briefly to skim through Ernie Davis's paper, he starts off with a discussion of what common sense knowledge is not. And it, it's something he's very interested in reasoning. Uh, there's not just uh, common sense, uh, a w world or encyclopedic knowledge. It's concerned with generalities rather than individuals. So in all the examples I had earlier, like, um, like Reno and, and San Diego, that's not really common sense knowledge. That's concerned with individuals. Um, and it's separate from purely linguistic or purely perceptual interpretations. And he has a num bunch of desiderata, desiderata, and I'm not going to go through all these in detail here. I do recommend you have a look at the paper. Uh, I, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, he does give uh, a number of examples and standard sort of CS uh, common, common sense benchmarks, which de depart from this desiderata. So I think it suggests we should go back and look at some of these benchmarks and see whether they really are appropriate for the task of common sense reasoning or not. Um, as for general issues about, you know, in terms of these benchmarks, should they be large or clean? And they're sort of contradictory. It's impossible to have a large, clean one. It's kind of you get one or the other. Um, should AI be trying to, should you be trying to be adversarial against current AI systems? And you suggest no, because you actually want to properly represent the problem space. And it is the case that you get the version three of the thing where previously version two got it right, version three might get it wrong. Um, should test sets be secret or published? And as we've seen, JetGP can't even reliably recall solutions already on the web, so it probably doesn't matter. Um, and there's a nice, he does this, concludes the paper with his analysis of common sense benchmarks. Um, and he discusses 12 of these in, in more details. And he concludes with a set of recommendations that they should be high quality, these benchmarks. They should focus on foundational common sense. Uh, and um, the clearly existing benchmarks are good enough. They need to have much greater scope and structural richness and complexity. The, the takeaway message, I'm now running out of time, from the paper with uh, Bernard Latal is that um, the, basically most papers just report aggregate metrics, and that's really not a great idea uh, because it doesn't give you a proper feel for how these systems really work. So uh, you have those benchmarks such as Big Bench, it's got great 100 tasks, but if you're just reporting your performance on that and all of these tasks are equally weighted, then they can give a very enforced impression about where the benchmark is, is where your system is doing well or, or, or badly. And um, so and in looking at four, um, papers in top AI venues, only apparently 4% of them actually fully report evaluation results. So this is a paper under review, and our plea in it is to actually, if you've been doing this kind of work, re make it fully reproducible. This is particularly important since you know, you, other people may not have the resources to replicate your results because of the co cost of running these models. Um, so path uh, forward, uh, given... Um, 
you know, report it for, for uh, A, the full results, but also do it by, by sort of different kind of categories of, of data. And as they ensure the instance by instance results are, are, are made publicly available. And there's some discussion in the paper about how to incentivize this, which again, I don't have time to talk about now. Um, I'll just very briefly mention this work uh, on categorizing evaluation instruments. This is work done, uh, funded by the OECD. They've got this project called AI and the Future of Skills. Uh, and um, th there's a couple of chapters in, 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 a, in a previous report, which uh, Jose Hernandez Arala and I wrote. And subsequently, we um, invited to work on a framework for assessing and comparing uh, benchmarks. And basically, we come up with these 18 different facets to characterize EIs. And, um, Again, I don't have time to talk about these, but basically we have these diff three, three different groups and they uh, cover, what, does it measure what we want to measure? Does it measure it effectively, uh, verifiably? And does it take, cheat all test uh, takers equally? And um, I don't have time to go through those, but basically we've evaluated this on the 36 evaluation instruments. And we think this might be of use to people designing new evaluation instruments and benchmarks, uh, AI system developers, and also to track the evolution of AI evaluation. Um, I just point you to uh, Gary Marcus's uh, Rebooting AI book, uh, which, uh, along with uh, D Ernie Davis, which I think is, you know, we need to be careful. Uh, current AI is in certainly in danger of being oversold. Um, the, uh, the big thing at the moment is newer symbolic, um, very active research area. I've done a little bit of work in this area, and I'm expected to be doing more of that. Um, and I know I'm out of time. So I think there's a comparison with self-driving cars uh, where Tesla says uh, that the, the automation should assist you with the most burdensome part, and I think there's an analogy made there with LLMs. Okay, I'll stop there and just leave that slide with you. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, but please catch him at the break and ask all your questions there. Uh, let's... Uh, Applaud once more. Thank you. They have your slides. They have your slides. Um, can you load my slides? I think they're there. They're, they will load them. Anyway, uh, our next speaker is Yarin Gal. And I'm very excited to see what he has to say. He's a professor at the University of Oxford. And I don't know what you're talking about here. Foundation models that can tell us what they don't know. Uncertainty in deep learning. This is uh, his big area. And I'm very excited to see what you'll tell us. Thank you. Nice. OK, so we have that. We have a clicker. Let's see which one, actually. Not. Mm, yeah. Okay, yeah, nice. Okay, so I'm gonna start by apologizing because I'm a bit under the weather. Uh, I made the effort still to come here today because I want to share some really exciting work that a brilliant student and uh, postdoc of mine did uh, on foundation models and specifically developing tools for foundation models to tell us when they don't know. Um, Thank you very much for the previous talk. I think that was a brilliant talk because that allows me to skip most of my introduction and motivation. Uh, I think we saw lots of examples where foundation models effectively just giving us nonsense, like answers, nonsense outputs when they don't know the answer. And if you rely on that for your workflow or if you rely on that in like search results from like Microsoft Bing or like summarizing a financial report, like asking a question about summarizing financial report, like we already saw uh, the limit, to, be, to be polite, like the limitations of some of those uh, approaches. And I'm gonna start, actually before I start, just to get to know my audience, because I wasn't sure how technical I should be. And I have some technical stuff, some less technical stuff, I can skip for the technical stuff. So just show of hands, who's done like machine learning Okay, nice, I can go technical. Um, I'm gonna have a couple of equations, not more than that, but mostly just to give you an idea for some, why this, some of this stuff is interesting. Um, if uh, you don't, uh, if it's getting too technical, you can just like, ignore that and just look at the bigger picture. Um, so just to get everyone on the same, like, uh, uh, same uh, 
to get everyone uh, to understand like, my notation. Uh, deep learning in one slide is conceptually very simple models. We have some data, X and Y, like images, I can't really see that, like let's say like images and labels, cats and dogs. If you give me some matrices and nonlinear function and define some, uh, basically what we call a network, a neural network, which transforms the input to the output, and our task is to find some Ws for which the outputs will be as close as possible to the labels that you gave me. I think we had a bunch of talks already explaining what these things are. Uh, I think we already saw some really good examples of why deep learning is pretty, uh, pretty useful. These uh, simple and modular building blocks allow us to get, build really complex systems, which uh, got a huge amount of attention from practitioners and engineers over the past uh, seven, eight years now that in turn gave us pretty good software tools that scale with data and compute and have had real world impact. At the same time, deep learning also has lots of limitations. We can't uh, really tell what our models know and what we don't know. They're per often perceived as uninterpretable black boxes, which are easily fooled, causing concerns in uh, AI safety, crucially rely on big data. And surprisingly, tying all of these like, issues together is a notion of like, these models don't have a notion of uncertainty. Uh, let me try to convince you why you should care about uncertainty. Let's say that you, you have an idea for an awesome new startup. You're going to build a dog breed classifier that a uh, user uploads a picture of the dog and you tell them which dog breed that is. Uh, and then obviously you're going to have a user that shows up and gives you this picture. Now, what would you want your classifier, your website, your service to do in that case? You wouldn't want to force this whatever that is that I've never seen before into a dog breed. You would want model to say, I don't know. You would want model to say, refuse to give you an answer and say, I might need more data. You might want to ask an expert what this thing is, but I don't know what this thing is. Um, this might sound like a contrived example, but we have the same situation appearing again and again in decision making, in physics, in life sciences. We need a way for our models to tell us when we don't know what we know and what we don't know. Um, and certainty also gives us an insight into the black box. Uh, we can see uh, where I'm uncertain. This is an example of autonomous driving domain. Uh, uncertainty can be even used to, uh, to identify when we are attacked with adversarial examples. And lastly, we need much less data if we only collect labels where the model is uncertain about its prediction. This allows us to avoid wear and tear robotics, uh, wasting ex expert time in medical analysis, and so on. Uh, what is, like, how do we formalize uncertainty? The language of uncertainty is probability theory, and specifically, I often talk about Bayesian probability theory that has its origins in the 1750s. Uh, 1750s, when we apply this to Information engineering, we get what we call Bayesian modeling. But instead of just trying to find a single function, we try to find all the possible functions that go for our data. Uh, this is uh, built on solid mathematical foundations and often perceived as orthogonal to deep learning. Uh, the, over the past, I think, like seven, eight years, we've had lots of like, innovation in the research and developments in the field that found lots of different ways of tying these things together, tying uncertainty and deep learning, and like a bunch of approaches like uh, doing ensemble or doing drop at a test time, and just like repeating that process 10 times and looking at the variance of the predictions. So basically disagreement of the samples of the output at some test location extra is like one of the simplest ways of, of trying to get an idea of when the model is, doesn't know the answer. The figure over here, we have like a depiction and the green is where we actually have the data. In red, when we haven't seen any training set, any training data. In green over here, we've seen training data. And you can see if we have like an ensemble of three models, all of them agree with each other on the data, left and right. And you would hope that they disagree with each other in the middle where you haven't seen data. And there are different methods that allow us to get models that will behave like that. Some of them more principled, some of them less principled. The main underlying mechanism underlying those methods is that uh, you would want them to have some disagreement. If I give you a predict, if I ask you what is, what should be the outcome? What should be the prediction at, at x equals three? Uh, one model says, oh, it should be zero. Confidently, definitely is zero. Another one says, 50, 50, zero, one. The green one says, oh, it's definitely one. This disagreement is what I rely on in order to tell, okay, my ensemble of models, my, like my model is basically this uh, a disagreement between those models, between these three components. 
is, like, because, uh, sorry, my model is this collection of free models, or my prediction is made based on the prediction of these free models, and they disagree with each other, therefore my model says, I don't know, don't trust my prediction. Um, okay, so we have tools for uncertainty. Uh, we can look at some examples we've actually done like six years ago, taking the CO2 levels in Mauna Lua, Hawaii, normalizing that, centering that, uh, predicting what will be the CO2 level in 20 years time. A uh, normal deep learning says this very confidently makes no sense. Bayesian approach says this, uh, it still makes no sense, but a model also has a very large uncertainty envelope. Each shade of blue is half a standard deviation. Model says it could be that, but I have no idea what's going on. So now that we can capture uncertainty in deep learning, we can do lots of really fun stuff with that. For example, if we look at going back to language, we can refuse to answer questions when we don't know the answer for generative language modeling, for example, for question answering. Or we can detect ambiguous questions and ask for clarifications. Or we can do human in the loop AI. Um, actually, not so fast because the tools that we talked about, if you try to use them for these applications, you would find very quickly that it's completely impractical. Um, with large language model foundation models, we can't afford to train multiple models for an ensemble. Over here, this figure over here, if we need to, if each one of these is a large language model and each one of these costs millions to train, then now we, the cost is gonna be three times as much in order to get to see whether the models actually agree with each other or not. Um, uh, training, yeah, millions. Um, also the entropy of multiple utterances in natural language generation doesn't actually capture what we think it does. Uh, if you give me the question, what is the capital of France? And let's say I have two models, model A, left, model B, right. Model A says, oh, probability 0.5, it's Paris. Probability 0.4, it's Rome. Probability 0.1, it's London. Model B says, generates Paris, probability 0.5, generates the utterance, it's Paris, and this utterance is assigned 0.4 and generates London 0.1. Which model is more uncertain about the output? Like actually, let's say like model A, who thinks that model A is more uncertain about the output? Who thinks that model B is more uncertain about the output? So we can actually see that if we ask, if you look at the entropy of those two models, it's actually the same. If you just naively use the same tools we talked about before, uh, like compute the entropy or the disagreement of these different things, even if we can afford to train three models, it actually will be the same as for both of them. Left model has prob like high probability for multiple cities. The right model is very certain the answer should be Paris, yet both of them have the same like, variance or entropy or disagreement between the different models. So what's going on? The issue is that entropy of the output utterance doesn't actually capture what we think it does. Uh, it, it would be high when we have syntactic diversity, whereas we only care about the semantic diversity of the utterances. Instead, we can define equivalence classes, C, over the outcome space, utterances, S, and match together utterances which are semantically equivalent. So what we can do is we change our model's output to be the semantic class C marginalizing over the utterances with the same meaning. So sum over all sentences, generated sentences that belong to the same semantic class C. And then we can define the entropy of this modified new model. We can define our mod entropy to be the entropy with respect to this marginal probability, with respect to the probability over the uh, semantic classes themselves. Um, main issue is that this thing is very much intractable and very, like, not even expensive to compute, it's just intractable. So we can approximate that with some Monte Carlo estimation, which I'm not gonna go in, into the detail for that, but you can look at the paper if you want to see that, just got accepted to ICLR. ICLR, ICLR one of them. Um, and we can actually get a fairly nice tractable approximation to this thing, which in practice just boils down to generate a set of utterances from the model by just, from the beam search itself, from the sing, single model that we trained, from the beam search, we just generate multiple utterances. We cluster them by semantic equivalence, and then we compute the entropy with respect to the equivalence classes, not with respect to the utterances. 
So with respect to this new semantic likelihood, we can actually see that the right model actually has much lower uncertainty than the left one. So if I were to decide like everything above 0.3, I'm gonna refuse to answer because I don't know the answer, then the right model, I would take, for example, the argmax, might be like Paris, because I have low uncertainty. The left model, I would say, I'm not gonna give you a prediction. So in practical terms, now we have, so we have practical uncertainty at hand, uh, you can refuse to answer questions. And it turns out that if you actually look at like, metrics like the area under the curve for the binary event, answer is correct. Uh, you don't need to worry about the details, but the main point is higher and bet is better and we managed to perform very well. Like the blue thing over here is the semantic uncertainty we just talked about, which is managed to make considerable improvement over the previous ways that we could have tried to tackle that. Now, okay. Now that we have a new tool to detect when a model is uncertain, we can use it uh, we can use it in some pretty cool ways. So let's say that you have a, you talk to ChatGPT, and you ask a question like, on what date did he land on the moon? Oh, sorry, I should have said, I should have highlighted. So this is work that was published by, Isla, uh, by uh, 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 Lawrence and Seb, so both of them are the student and postdoc I mentioned. Uh, you ask ChatGPT, on what date did he land on the moon? If you notice, there's some really interesting question, uh, there's some really interesting uh, peculiarity about this question, which is, you shouldn't be able to answer this question. There's missing information over here. Yet the model ChatGPT very happily tells us he landed on the moon in 1969. What I would want the model to do is to ask, who do you mean by he in your question? And then you can clarify, actually I'm talking about Alan Bean, and then the answer should be 1969. Um, we can actually use the tools we talked about earlier, the tool for, to quantify uncertainty, to quantify when the model doesn't know the answer, in order to do something much more interesting than just naive dialogues. We can introduce structure into our dialogues. We can use a decision graph where the user asks a question. If the model decides that it's very confident in the answer, i.e. it's not ambiguous, it has all the information it needs, and you just give the answer. On the other hand, if the model decides it's ambiguous, then the model can ask clarifying question, provide a cl user provides a clarification, and the model then gives the final answer based on the complete information that it now has. So what would that look like? Uh, it might look like as follows. So chat interface, this is what you as a user see. Uh, this is the internal representation, knowledge representation for the model. So step one, a user asks a question and the question is cl uh, classified as ambiguous. Uh, on what date did he land on the moon? The step two, the language model, uh, after we've done the, uh, this step, the, uh, this, we decided this is an ambiguous question using tools for uncertainty. Then what, what we do then is we generate a clarifying question. And we can do that very simply by just manipulating some forms. We basically say, the user said on what date he landed on the moon. But to answer this question, you need to ask the following clarifying question. And then you feed it as an input to your generative language model, which would output, who is he? And you serve that question back to the user, the user clarifies Alan Bean, and then you construct a new prompt. The user said A, both asked B, user answered C, both, complete the sentence. And then you get 1969 because it will actually have the complete reference of what is the, like what does uh, he uh, resolves as. Um, so that looks quite cool, isn't it? Now I dare you to try to do research with a sort of, with a sort of uh, question, this sort of challenge, this sort of problem, because how do you evaluate your system? How, do you, how can you even tell if your system manages to ask correct clarifying questions? I can't afford to have my students sitting all day long and acting as the user in this thing to evaluate my system. It's gonna be quite expensive to iterate over uh, different ideas for black forms or different tools for uncertainty. So what we can actually do is a fairly smart thing. We can borrow ideas from active learning, which I'm gonna talk a bit more about in a second. And we can use an oracle that has access to privileged information. 
So we can design a point. I basically am going to construct a data set, a corpus of trivia questions, where I have pairs of questions. One is ambiguous, one is non-ambiguous. And I basically I tell the, in the prompt, I say, my privileged information is that I know this is what the user's intention is. This is what the user asked me. Then you can, uh, you, can gen you can evaluate your clarifying question by just feeding in your generated clarifying question into here, letting the model generate answer, and then look at the accuracy for the trivia uh, question answering system. Um, it turns out that this works quite well. Um, if you look at the performance of, uh, we, we can avoid asking clarifying questions. Well, we can avoid for, can avoid asking for clarifying questions with, well, we can basically ask for only for clarifying questions when we have unambiguous questions. Unambiguous, ah. we can ask clarifying questions when we have ambiguous questions. We can avoid asking unnecessarily for clarifying questions when we don't need additional information. And uh, this improves performance quite a bit. So on the left-hand side, look at that. Using the thing that we talked about here, we can detect we can only we can detect when we should ask for clarifying questions compared to just other ways that you might try to do that. And it turns out when when you ask for clarifying questions, we can actually answer questions correctly, which otherwise obviously you wouldn't have the correct information to know what the answer should be. So I have like five more minutes. Um, in the last minute, like in the last five minutes I have, I'm going to talk about something very different, uh, not language related, but uh, active learning related uh, with foundation models for vision. So we actually had a project with a Google Brain uh, on a called uh, Plex, which is a very annoying name because if you try to Google Google Plex, you're going to get very different, uh, like it's going to be very difficult to find the paper. But we looked at how does a pre-training uh, affect a model performance uh, for tasks like active learning, for tasks where we want to acquire data. Uh, uh, well, actually, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna explain what is active learning here. So I don't have the Plex results over here, but I think I'm gonna, instead, I'm gonna explain active learning for a different project that we had uh, with uh, Galaxy Zoo in, a, in astronomy. Because I think we have, I have some nice, I have some pretty pictures over here. Uh, but the main point is that uh, we've looked at extensions of this using foundation models, large pre-trained, tra trained over billions of images, and to see whether that actually improves active learning performance. So what is active learning? Um, over here, I have the picture of the Northumberland Telescope in Cambridge in 1833 on the left, and a picture of when. Uh, when I was in Cambridge about uh, 10 years ago when I took this picture on the right. Um, over here, we have a picture of the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, uh, just before the dish collapsed, actually, uh, when I visited them in uh, uh, 2017. Um, in the past, in the field of astronomy, an astronomer would literally sit uh, under the telescope, make an observation, find a new source, find a new galaxy, and then get a paper published in the Royal Society of Astronomy saying, I found this new planet or whatever. Um, as the years uh, passed, we built more and more powerful telescopes. We started collecting immense amounts of data. And even this, this, is, this massive telescope is nothing compared to the amount of data generated by the new telescopes that we are just deploying now. And the problem of analyzing this data, the problem of building uh, basically this uh, sky surveys uh, and building the astronomical catalogs out of those sky surveys, which astronomers use to test hypotheses about the, the origin of the universe and so on, has become immensely difficult because we just have millions and millions of observations and we can't afford to sit down and label them by hand anymore. Um, what uh, came about in order to solve this problem is a project called Galaxy Zoo, uh, which used volunteer efforts in order to label galaxies, for example, over here, a volunteer would say this is a featured galaxy or a smooth galaxy, and then collect those in order to build the catalogs of all those different uh, galaxies in the sky. The issue is that now we have so many, gal so many galaxies, so many sources that we, can't even, we don't even have, have enough volunteers to label all these things. So instead of that, what we use is use machine learning and specifically use 
something called active learning, where we get some data for volunteers to label, and then we train a machine learning model over that labeled data set. That machine learning model can be a large foundation model where we fine tune that over the labeled training set. And then we evaluate what we call an acquisition function over a massive, train, over a massive pool set of galaxies that we haven't labeled yet. Um, we ask an expert to label only the points with the highest acquisition value that we think will be the most informative for us to label. We add them to the training set and then we refine the model. We fine tune the model with the new labeled uh, points added to the training set. Um, what acquisition function should we use? Uh, for example, you might use uh, uncertainty. You might look at where the model doesn't know what the answer should be because it has multiple hypotheses about, let's say, you give it a galaxy over here. And the model says, well, it could be that, could be that, could be that. I don't know what the answer should be. You ask a, an expert or 10 volunteers to label that. You get a new label, and then you update the model to collapse that uncertainty. Uh, so uh, this was published uh, at the Royal Astronomical Society a few years ago together with uh, Louis Smith, Mike Wilmsey, and Chris Lintot uh, from the Zooniverse Citizen Science Project. Um, and it turns out that we can actually get massive gains in volunteer, uh, volunteer resources. We need to get much less volunteers to label data if we only ask them to label where the model thinks it's might, it might be mistaken. Uh, I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to be in two minutes. Uh, before, uh, yeah, nice. Uh, and basically, I'm just going to, well, fine. Uh, we still have a minute and a half left. Um, one of the cool things is that a side effect, a side result of this system, it actually allows us to find interesting events. Uh, if we were to just randomly acquire data, then the data, for example, over here we have smoothness. And it, most of the galaxies are smooth and not that interesting. And if you just uniformly subsample the massive pool set and get volunteers to label that, you will find that most of the events are really not that interesting. You're just wasting your volunteer efforts. On the other hand, if you use active learning, it will say, okay, I've seen smooth galaxy, I don't care about that anymore. I'm gonna go for the less smooth ones, for the feature ones, because I haven't seen these yet. And then you can actually diversify and find much more interesting examples for volunteers to label and actually do new science. Um, final slide, I think there's much more research to be done. Uh, develop new tools to help others build safe and robust machine learning for responsible deployment in industry and academia. Uh, and we even haven't talked about any of the stuff in autonomous driving, medical applications, safe reinforcement learning, and much more. Thank you so much.